Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Welcome, everybody, to the PBC Podcast. I'm Kenneth Buhari. And I'm Michael Rosenthal, editor of USA Today's Boxing Junkie. Thanks, as always, for tuning in, as we have a lot to go over this week. Joining us will be undefeated 140-pound contender Gary Antoine Russell and trainer of the year candidate Bob Santos. We'll take a look back at this weekend's action, last weekend's action, I should say. And in this week's toe-to-toe segment, Mike and I will list our five greatest fighters of the 21st century. So, A lot to unpack here. Let's jump right into our first interview. He trains many of the top fighters in the game today, but again, a potential trainer of the year candidate, and he's not just some overnight success story, as you will soon find out from the man himself, Bob Santos. Uh, Bob, first things first, congrats on a big weekend last Saturday. How many corners did you work? Was it like four corners that I saw you in? Yeah, I probably worked four corners. That's a that's a typical, Jeez. you know, night for me. I've been doing that, you know, for the better part of 31 years. Wow. Now we we saw you with Andre Durrell. Um Did not know that you were training him. When did you begin uh, working with Andre? You know what? Actually, he had a, a, a guy by the name of Theo who, who's been with him, and they asked me to assist him in the corner, me and my son. So. Uh, you know, we just got together, you know, just right before the fight to assist him in the corner in in any way that we could and and things of that nature. What did you think of his uh, performance in the fight? You know what? I I thought it was, I thought it was a great performance by him. You know, take out even his age and just, you know, obviously that's a factor, but you know, I, I thought it was a tremendous performance by him. And then, like I said, when you do, consider his age but if you take that out i mean that would have been a great performance for anybody that was 28 years old i was, I was yeah. very impressed yeah, yeah i'll say so and, you and all get a very durable guy you know who had just come off a very very tough fight uh with zerto and, and and things of that nature so i mean uh, i mean for a fight that wasn't uh, on a, a any of the main uh telecast for showtime that's a very very tough fight yeah, I thought it was a nice statement from him, too. Um, he also worked the corner of uh, David Morrell. In your opinion, is he ready for the elite guys at 168? Where do you think he stands? Well, you know, I'll tell you this. I know David Benavides real well. I actually, uh, you know, was in camp with him. I actually live with him. I know him very well, and I, and I think the utmost of him, he's uh, uber-talented. Um, that said... Uh, David Morales is just different. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind if they fight, David Morales is going to be victorious against him. And uh, same thing with Caleb Plant or any of those guys. David Morales is a special, special talent. Believe me when I, when I say that. He is a special, special talent. So you think he's ready right now? You don't think a couple oh, more fights? Be, or... uh, if I, if, you know, if... I could make that fight. I'd put him I, I would have put him in before that fight. I would, you know, they were talking about the <laughs> fight he made. They came to me and they said, what do you think? I said, you know, they asked me in my opinion. And I mean, I says, well, to me, he beats Benavides now. Um, wow. There's no doubt in my mind that he beats Benavides. What about Canelo Alvarez? No doubt. He beats Canelo. I mean, let, let, let's, just, let's just look at his face. Morale is taller than Baval a lot longer than Baval. He's left-handed, and I can tell you this for a fact, he's a bigger puncher than Baval. So what is mm-hmm. what is Canelo going to do to beat him? Does he, is he, is, he ain't going to outbox him. He's yeah. not longer than him. He's left-handed. We all know he has problems with lefties, so basically he can do everything Baval can do better and longer and faster. And, and Morales is just a special, special talent. I, I, I'll put it to you this way. If the guy wasn't boxing, he'd be playing center field for the Yankees. He'd be a, a, a major league soccer star. I've seen him with a soccer ball. He does things that are just 
unreal. His foot speed is unreal. He'd be a receiver in the NFL. I mean, this guy is just a different, different level talent. Now, you, you also had a couple other fighters on the card. I think Demler, Zamora, and uh, Yoannis uh, Tellez, I believe. What, what can you tell us about those guys? Well, um, Demler, Zamora, you know, as, as many people remember, he was nicknamed the Black Apino by Floyd Mayweather when he used to be in all those Al Axis, his training in his gym when he was a kid. And uh, that said, uh, you know, he trained with Roger Mayweather. So, you know, all, obviously he got invaluable experience uh, with them. And then he's came over to train, you know, when Roger had the illness and so forth, you know, they sent him over here and he's been training with us at the pound for pound gym. And, uh, so he, he, he I think he's somebody to keep your eye on, you know, uh, very, very talented. Again, he's a lefty and he could do a lot of different things. You know, he's 10 and 0. he's 19 years old. He turned pro at 16. Um, so definitely, I think he's somebody to keep your eye on and the guy, the last guy we just fought, you know, he, uh, Devin Haney didn't get him out of there. He went the distance with Devin Haney. He's only been stopped one time in 25 fights. And three times we were very, very close to getting him out of there. I think it had been eight rounds. We would have stopped him. But that said, you know, for a 19-year-old, fight a guy with 25 pro fights, and we won every single round convincingly. So he's, he's, a, he's a very talented kid. And uh, Talix is out there. with. He was here training with me uh, pound for pound. But I had so many guys, I thought it was best that he moved with Ronnie Shields. And me and Ronnie have a good, close relationship. Sure. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think he's going to be fine out there with Ronnie, obviously. Now, you know, it's, you mentioned 31 years in the uh, in the sport. I, you've got quite a story. My understanding is that you first started doing business with Al Heyman uh, 20 years ago, maybe started even before then. Could you tell us that story? In, in terms of what? Can you repeat that? I, I said my understanding is that you first started doing business with Al Heyman 20 years ago, but or, or perhaps even longer than then. Could you tell us how you, you, you guys met and, and the story of how you guys started working together? You know, the, the first time I was uh, introduced about Al Heyman was, was Lamont Jones. And uh, oh. that being said, you know, he, he was telling me, uh, you know, a, a lot about Al and so on and so forth. But where the, where the relationship was really forged is I have a relationship obviously with Louis DeCubis Jr. that I've worked with. I worked with his father before him mm. and then me and him really forged a great relationship and, and, and so forth with Joel Casamayor, Robert Guerrero, you know, to, uh, uh, Ares Landalara, to name a few. And uh, Louis was the one that basically told me, look, there's nobody better than Al. And uh, that's, who we need to work with and, and, and thank God we did. And, and I'm so thankful because, um, to me, he changed my whole life. I know he changed my fighters lives. And, you know, like I said, I've worked with people at top rank. I got nothing bad to say about that. I had Carlos Cruz Cruz or Carlos Cruz at, at, at the time that worked with, uh, you know, Don King. So I've worked with, with all of them, Dan Goose. And, and to me, Nobody takes care of the fighter better than Al Heyman. There's nobody better in boxing. Uh, he's second to none. Um, and uh, thank God that he's involved in the sport of boxing. Interesting. What a story. Yeah. So were you always a fan of boxing? How and where did you first get involved in the sport? Well, I've always been a fan of boxing because my my – Mother's cousin, my cousin, uh, Louis Molina, he fought in the 1956 Olympics. So, you know, that, that uh, Puerto Rican descent. And so he's the first Marine ever to, uh, first boxer to ever rep represent the Marines in the Olympics, like I said, 1956. So that's always been a pride of our family to, you know, have a, a relative Puerto Rican descent, obviously, that uh, uh, fought in the Olympics. And so... Uh, we've always been in, involved in boxing. My brothers, my father put us in, in all sports. And so uh, it's always been a big part of our lives. Where did you grow up? San Jose, California. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm down south in L.A. Interesting. Um, other than uh, Robert Guerrero, who are some of the other champions and contenders you've helped guide? Well, obviously, I worked with Joel Casamayor. You know, I worked with Hector Lazaraga, who only had 25 amateur, amateur fights and became a, you know, IBF featherweight champion of the world. 
you know, I worked with Jose Salaya, who's a 2000 alternate in the Olympic team. And, you know, I, I was a head coach for him. He got to number one in the world. So, you know, you know, I've been doing this a long, long time. Um, I was the head coach, obviously, for Mario Barrios and took him all the way to number one in the world. So, mm. you know, I, I, you know, Laura, I've been involved with him. You know, I worked w- with Rancis Bartholomew when, when he won one of his world championships. Um, so, you know, it's been a plethora of, of, of fighters that I've, that I've worked with, that I've been in camps. I've been in many camps with Sugar Shane Mosley. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this quite a long time. Uh, being in camps, watching James Tony, obviously with Freddie Roach, and being with Joe Goosen, and 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 you know, and and helping in camps with Chico Corrales. The interesting story is, we had Casamayor, who had fought uh, Chico Corrales, yeah. and for whatever reason, I don't know what the rift was, but uh, him and Joe had a rift, and at that time we were working out of Joe's gym, and I was helping Joe, and then uh, you know they switched and. Joe became the head coach for Corrales, and I had Robert Guerrero, and we were helping him prepare for Casamore on the next one. And then a few fights later, Joel came back to us. So you know how boxing is. It's it, it, it's a real interesting sport, to say the least. It certainly is. That's quite a story. Uh, now, some traders might work with two guys or three guys. How do you find time to work with so many? Well, you know, at the end of the day, there's 24 hours, obviously, you, you know, I only need to sleep four or five. You got 20 hours in the day. And, you know, so certain amount of guys will come in the morning, certain amount of guys are coming in, you know, uh, mid morning, afternoon and, and later in the night. And that being said, you know, when I came into the sport, there was no such thing as conditioning coaches. You know, a coach was everything. You did everything. So like, you know, I was fortunate enough to, uh, work with Emmanuel Stewart, with Jose Celaya, um, and, and 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 see how he did things. I was fortunate enough to spend many years with Joe Goose and see how he did things. I was fortunate enough to be at the wild card for a long, long time and see how he did things. And I've been fortunate enough to be out there in Houston with Ronnie Shields and see how he did things. And like I said, when I came into this sport, there's no such thing as a conditioning coach. So that being said, even with my fighters, it's not just the boxing gym. I want to. I want to be on the runs. I want to know how I how I can push you in the fight, not just by what I see in the gym, but what I see outside of the gym. Mm. And that's how, that's how I was brought up in the sport. You know, with my cousin who fought in the '56 Olympics and his trainers, and uh, you know, and I guess obviously the last I don't know 10, 15 years they started saying, oh, this is a conditioning coach, and this. When I was involved in the sport, like I said, there's a coach, and he did everything. And, and that's what I pride myself on is, is trying to do to do everything, to know what's going on with the fighter. So that when I look at that fighter in the corner and he knows it's time to bite down, he knows, hey, this guy got up with me at five in the morning. This guy bit down with me when I was on those runs in the snow or whatever the case may be. And I think that, that that's invaluable to the fighter and, and myself. No, aside from the ones we've already mentioned, which fighters are you working with now? Well, I have uh, Lanier Perot, who's, uh, you know, number seven WBA uh, heavyweight. Uh, it was a 2016 Olympian from Cuba. Um, he should be coming up in an eliminator pretty soon to be fighting for the WBA heavyweight championship of the world. I also have his brother. You know, he'll be making his pro debut. He was a 2020 Olympian heavyweight from Cuba um, at 20 years old. You don't hear too much about heavyweights, you know, making an Olympic team at 20 years old. And he'll be making his debut. On December 2nd, I also have Victor Santillon. He's top five in the world at 122 pounds. I have Eric Rosa, the 105-pound WBA uh, world champion. He, he should be fighting here uh, December 17th. Mario Barrios is now back training with me. Um, you know, so uh, obviously I have Hector Garcia. Um, we'll see what's next for him. Alberto Puello, who just won the 140-pound world championship. Carlos Adamas, who just won the 160-pound interim WBC world championship. So uh, we we got a plethora of talent in our gym, and, and I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, sounds like and you're I, a busy I guy. And I can't forget, and I, I better, I'd be remiss if I forgot, and I also have Kevin Brown, uh, you know, who beat Iglesias, a gold medal winner. He beat Andy Cruz in the amateurs. You know, had over 400 amateur fights, and 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 he should be 
we're probably he'll be in his third or fourth fight and we're probably going to put him in an eliminator for a world title at 140 pounds too he's a very very special talent too cool. Cool. You mentioned uh, in that list, you mentioned Carlos Adamas, who delivered an explosive stoppage of uh, Juan Macias Montiel recently. What can When can we expect him back in the ring? Boy, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, obviously, that's up to, to Al Heyman, um, you know, uh, and, and, and I guess the networks, whatever dates that they have available. But we would love to have him in the ring sooner rather than later. And uh, he's a very special talent, too. He's a very, very special talent. Yeah, it seemed pretty obvious in that fight. Uh, I guess he'd like to fight Jamal Charlo. If that doesn't happen, are there, is there a guy, a specific guy you guys are targeting? You know, I you know, I did a podcast the other day, and, and, and that was a question that they, they asked of me. And, and, and I could tell you this. For me, I'd put him in with anybody at 160 pounds or 168. Obviously not David Morrell because I, I work with David Morrell. And 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 I'm and I'm a part of his team, but outside of David Morrell, um, I would put Adamas in with any 160 pounder. I would put him in with Caleb Plant today. I would put him in with Benavides. I've seen him in spar. You know, he sparred all those guys. I, I know what he's capable of. So I'd put him in with anybody. It's just a matter of is he going to get the opportunity? Interesting. Well, we hope so. I mean, he's he's a great, great fighter. Now, you, you've got another one of your fighters, uh, Alberto Pollo. He's due for a ring return. Is there any update on when that might be and, and against who? You know, I had heard that they were talking about us fighting uh, Antoine Russell. I don't know what the status of that is, if that's going to happen or not happen. I think it would be a great fight, obviously. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know what exactly is going to be next for him. Uh, again, I guess that's uh, up to the networks and, and, and whatever agreements that they can, uh, you know, come to. But uh, that being said, we're, we're ready for any of those people. What do you, how, how li- sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, how likely do you think is that showdown versus uh, Gary Antoine Russell? I, you know, I don't I don't I don't know. Um, obviously, they're both with PBC. Um, so obviously, I think it's a fight that definitely can be made. Uh, when that happens, I, I don't know. But, uh, uh, again, uh, Pueyo, as he proved with that Russian, he's willing to take on anybody at any time. How do you, how, what do you think of Russell? And if, if he ended up fighting Russell, how do you think that fight would play out? I think it's a great fight. Um, I definitely favor my guy. I think we're the more experienced fighter. Um, but I think it would be a great fight. I think it would be an entertaining fight. Uh, you, you know, the fans would be the winners in that one, but definitely I think that we would come out victorious. How about uh, Hector Garcia? He mentioned a move up to 135. Do you think he's going to stay and defend his title at 130, or do you see him moving up in weight? Uh, he's another one, again, uh, obviously. Um, we'll, we'll see what opportunities present themselves. And, you know, obviously he just became the you know, WBA world champion at 130 pounds. Um, so we're, we're willing to take on anybody at 130 pounds. Um, if an opportunity presented itself at 135, um, you know, I feel confident that we can compete with those guys at 135. So let's just see, you know, what opportunities present themselves. Um, you know, it's interesting in the case with him with, you know, I remember when Shakur had won the, the title and, and right away he says, oh, he wanted all the bouts. And I put it out there right away on boxing team. Well, we're, we're ready to rock and, and go. And the very next day, Bob Aram says, well, we don't need to unify the bouts. So <laughs> I think that speaks volumes um, of what type of uh, talent that, that Hector is. And, and hopefully uh, he'll get a great opportunity here and, 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 and sooner rather than later. Um, so I, I don't know. Maybe we could unify with one of the champions at 130. Mm. Now, uh, we mentioned Garcia, Pueyo, uh, Adamus, uh, not to mention Michelle Rivera and Elvis Rodriguez. I mean, we've never seen so many top-tier Dominican uh, boxers in the sport. What do you attribute this to? You know, I, I think – I know Michelle Rivera – very well i've worked in his corner too um and and he's trained over here at pound for pound with us and and uh i know him very well 
so I could speak a little bit about about him and obviously Eric Rosa, I'm his head trainer and 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 Puello and Garcia and those guys. Um I think opportunity, you know, they they've been they've been presented with opportunities and they've capitalized on the opportunities and I think the talent has always been there but it's opportunity and then you know you see one guy get over the hump and you're like, you know, man, he he can do it, why can't I do it, you know? And I think confidence breeds confidence. And so I see their fellow countrymen are doing big things, good things. And, 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 and you, you start getting that, that swag, you know, and, and definitely they have it now. And I'm very thankful that uh, I've been a part of helping the Dominicans for the first time with Eric Rosa, with uh, uh, Puello, with Garcia, with Adamas. For the first time in history, you have more Dominican world champions at the same time than you do Cubans and Puerto Ricans. It's never happened in the history of their country. Yeah, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, okay, so who in your stable among all your prospects, and we know you have a bunch of guys, who do you think is the next guy who's going to emerge, you know, sort of, you know, become a star? Um. In terms of uh, of a fighter that's kind of unknown, hasn't been on TV, right? Or 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 a guy that I think is going to be like a pay per view star. Uh, in that regard, I think it's going to be David Morales. Just going to really just just take it to another level. I just think he's just a it, just a uh, an unbelievable, you know, once in a decade or longer type talent. Um, in terms of being uh, guys that haven't been on TV and, and haven't had that opportunity, I think uh, the Black Capino that we have, DJ Zamora, I think definitely he's a kid. He's only 19. He turned pro at 16. He has a good pedigree. Obviously, you know, he trained, you know, in the Mayweather gym. And I give a lot of credit to, to, to Roger, uh, you know, in, in helping develop him. He's left-handed and he could do a lot of different things. So I, I think he's a guy that definitely can win a world championship and, and be a really, really special fighter for us too. Cool. Keep, we'll definitely keep a close eye on him. So finally, uh, you, you mentioned several times that you, you've been doing this for a long time. So what's the secret to your staying power? You know, I, I did, I think hard work. I think, you know, my, you know, my father and my mother always instilled in us hard work. You know, I, I, I come from a family, you know, that we we used to pick in the fields. I used to pick apricots in, in, in the fields, and so uh, leaving no stone unturned and and just hard work, with you know whatever it takes to get the job done. And, and I think when you do that, sooner or later, and you keep, just keep plugging away, plugging away, plugging away, that you know you're going to be successful. And I think the fighters appreciate that, they, and they know that. So, you know, many times I would be gone on the road. 10 months out of the year away from my wife and kids in terms of I'd go to a camp for two months, maybe come home for a week out on the road again for two months. I'd be in camps, like I said, with Ronnie Shields in Houston for two months. Then I'd be in camps with Emmanuel Stewart, with Jose Celaya for months at a time. Then I'd be in camps with, you know, uh, Joe Goosen. I spent a lot, a lot of time with those guys. And so I was very fortunate too in some senses that I never really got the head job or the opportunity. There was guys that, like I said, I took to number one in the world, but I never really got the, the head opportunity. And in a lot of senses, the timing's everything. And I was blessed because I'm one of the few guys that could say, Hey, I've, I've been in camps with Ronnie Shields. I've been in camps with Emmanuel Stewart. I've been in camps with Joe Goosen. And I was able to pick from, you know, those, those guys, to me, the masters and learn from them, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what can I pick from this guy, what, and that guy. And so fortunately, when the opportunity came for me to really take it to over to that next level, um, I, I was ready to meet the challenge. Uh, thank the good Lord, Jesus Christ. Great stuff, Bob. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, learned a lot from talking to you. So we appreciate that. And we look forward to having you back. Hey, thank you guys so much, and God bless you guys. And uh, let's pray, uh, you know, uh, uh, for Adios, the the that just fought morale, that that everything comes out okay with him, and and yeah. and, and and everybody should keep him in, in in their prayers, and 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 God willing, everything's gonna be okay with him. 
Last Saturday, fight fans were treated with action throughout the day, and we're going to unpack it all, beginning with the PBC Showtime headliner featuring undefeated WBA 168-pound champion David Morrell Jr. against unbeaten mandatory challenger Idos Yerbasa Nuli. Morrell taking on the toughest challenge of his career, Yerbasa Nuli, and he made a statement dominated, finished him off in the 12th and final round. But before we get into the fight, we want to say that our thoughts and prayers are with uh, your boss Anuli and his family as he is uh, currently hospitalized, just praying that he makes a full recovery. As for Morel, Mike, how did he look to you? First, amen about what you added there at the end. Uh, I thought uh, Morel looked terrific. Uh, he was there was a complete performance from him. I thought the best of his career. You know, he was in control. You know, throughout the fight, even in the, in the face of your boss Anuli's pressure, and that's some serious pressure he applies to his opponents. Uh, I thought Morel boxed really well. You know, whether that was from the inside or the outside, he broke down his opponent and he, and he delivered a, a brutal, spectacular knockout. You know, you can't do much better than that. Yeah, you certainly can. You're right. I mean, it was a complete performance. But where is there room for improvement? You know, honestly, it was kind of hard to find flaws in that performance. Um, if anything, maybe he could move a little bit more than he did. Maybe maybe do more of his work from the outside. Uh, mm. And definitely don't allow your opponent to back you into the ropes as he yeah. did in, in, a, in a couple of rounds a few times. Uh, although he might have just been taking a rest. I don't know. It's just probably not a good idea in general. Uh, he just he knew he can get away with that against uh, this opponent. Uh, that might not be the case against the next level guy. So maybe these are things he needs to think about. Yeah, certainly the backing into the ropes, that thing kind of stood out um, to me. And I think that's part of just gaining more experience and getting a few more 10, 12 rounders under his belt. Defense, too, although, I mean, I, I thought overall he looked great um, defensively. But he just needs more experience. I mean, the guy's got less than 40 rounds under his belt. And, you know, getting comfortable in that, you know, big fight atmosphere. How does Morrell fare against the division's elite? Is Is he ready for that? I have to be careful not to draw concrete conclusions because of your boss Anuli's limitations, although I think he's a good fighter. He's not that, you know, next level fighter. Uh, but honestly, I, I'm not sure I agree with sort of the what you were implying. I think that Morel is there now pretty much. Uh, you know, he's one of those guys like Lomachenko and Rigondeau, you know, who refined his skills as an amateur and he sort of hit the ground running as a pro. So, yeah, he's only had eight fights, but he's far more advanced than that. Uh, oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, a few more fights against contenders certainly wouldn't hurt. Um, he could always, you know, get a little bit better. Uh, but I think he could hang with anyone right now. I'm not sure I'd pick him necessarily to beat everyone, but I think he could hang with anyone. So so who would you like to see him face next? Well, Morel wants David Benavides, which I understand. Um, and I think he'd be a threat to Benavides. The fact is, he's, it's not going to be Benavides or Plant or Canelo <laughs> Alvarez right away, or so it seems that way. So I think he, he has no choice but to wait anyway. Uh, in the meantime, you know, I, one guy I thought of was Chiron Davis, who's a good, capable guy. Yeah. Uh, that's not an easy fight. I thought of Caleb Truax, although yeah. Truax hasn't fought for a long time. I don't know what his status is. Uh, I think that's the kind of opponent we'll see him fight next. And and that's OK. He's he's not he's young. He still has he still has time. Yeah, absolutely. I like I like the names you mentioned. Uh, Danny Jacobs was another person that came to mind, um, you know, which, which would yeah. be a really good fight. But I, I suspect in 2023, we're going to see Morrell take significant steps towards challenging the, uh, the top dogs. Yeah, for certain. I mean, yeah. certainly one to watch for next year. Um, also on the card. Former unified 154-pound champion Jason Rosario took on Brian Mendoza in a middleweight matchup. Mendoza coming up from 154, and, I mean, we got a surprise. I got a surprise. Mendoza looked excellent, scored two knockdowns, uh, stopped Rosario in five rounds brutally with the, with the right uppercut. What did you make of his performance? I thought he was good, better than I thought he would be. Remember, we I think we both agree that he's a good boxer, but he was better than I thought. Uh, yeah. I thought. I thought he boxed well. You know, he was leading on on all three cards, I think. Uh, and then he just lowered the boom. You know, that right uppercut to end the fight was just epic. It was a perfect right uppercut. Uh, I think that was a statement win for Mendoza. Mm -hmm. I, that, that could lead to a big fight for him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as as you mentioned, we both thought he was a good boxer, but he looked elite. Uh, on Saturday night, I mean, he showed a plethora of skills, ring generalship, not to mention 
real confidence. Um, he said, you know, he'd been training for seven months, had taken on some other fights on short notice. And so, you know, he was going to be fully prepared for this one. And yes. I, I think <laughs> it showed. Uh, Rosario, on the other hand, announced his retirement uh, afterward. What did you uh, what did you make of that? I think it's a smart move. Uh, I think he can still box. Uh, he still has that power. That's not going to go anywhere. He just doesn't seem to have the punch resistance any longer. Yeah. You know, you know, he's been stopped in all three of his last uh, last three meaningful fights. You know, the last time against a naturally smaller man. You know, uh, Mendoza's small, uh, small at that weight. So not only did he get knocked out, he got knocked out by a small guy. Uh, you know, Rosario can always say he was a title holder, which he earned by upsetting Julian Williams, which was a huge win for him, but he really didn't do anything after that. Yeah. I mean, that was his peak. And then the, you know, and sort of the crescendo, I, I you know, I, I'm not sure what happened there or what happened to him, but he's had, he's had a fine career and I, you know, totally understand him wanting to hang up the gloves. If he thinks he can't do it anymore, then, you know, uh, who am I to say anything? Get it back to Mendoza, though. He moved up to 164 this fight. He's a natural 154-pounder. Where do you think he should campaign? Well, I would almost always say you should fight at the lower weight as long as you could make it comfortably. You know, why not? Why fight a bigger, probably stronger guy if you don't have to? Uh, and I believe he could make – I haven't heard anything to say that he can't make 154, uh, 154 pounds. Uh, you know, the only reason for him to stay at 160 is, would be to chase a particular fight, which I don't think he's he's doing. So I expect him to fight at junior middleweight in his next fight, but who knows? I don't know what they're thinking in their camp. Yeah, and junior middleweight, so it's such a deep division. Uh, he can find plenty of top names there if he chooses to do that. Who do you think he should face next? Well, suddenly you have options when you turn in a performance like that. You know, I thought of you know, the guy, the same guys that we mentioned a lot, Tony Harrison, Danny Garcia, Charles Conwell, Brian Castaño, uh, maybe Jesus Ramos, uh, you know, any of those guys. Uh, if he decides to stay at 160, you know, I have... For some reason, I, I thought he fought Jesus Ramos. Let me... Uh, oh, oh, you know what, rematch. I'm sorry, you know what? Yeah, I actually honestly blanked on that, but he definitely yeah. lost to Jesus Ramos. Maybe a rematch? I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm just, I sort of accidentally threw out the rematch possibility. I had forgotten that he lost to, to Ramos. Uh, that's actually what one of the reasons that was his performance was so special is he exactly. bounced back from that uh, to do what he did to Jason Rosario. So I apologize for uh, missing the boat on that. Uh, and if he decides to stay at 160, which is possible, I, I think I have the guy, you know, Fyodor uh, Cherkazin. Uh, who we'll talk about in a, in a minute, about a minute from now. Uh, another potential middleweight opponent I thought of mm. was, was Julian Williams, uh, who we'll also talk about in a little bit. You know, that <laughs> fight, I think, would make a lot of sense for both guys. Yeah, and let's talk about Fyodor uh, uh, Cherkazin right now, actually, because he was in the televised opener. He's undefeated middleweight contender. He took on uh, the veteran Nathaniel Gallimore. I mean, he looked good, you know, clean sweep on my cards, 10-run unanimous decision. Uh, win for him. What'd you make of his, uh, how he looked? I think he looked terrific. This guy um, is another guy that I knew I thought was pretty good going into the fight, but he did even better than I thought he was going to do. Uh, I don't think he's a super quick, super athletic or super powerful guy, uh, but he's solid in all those d departments. And I think he's super clever. I think he's a really smart boxer. I love his poise, which I think comes from his experience in both mixed martial arts and boxing. He's been boxing now for, I don't think like eight years. Uh, he's a really confident guy. Uh, I also like. I also think he's a big middleweight, and he's also really, really fit. Looks that, yeah, that's obvious. So you add, if you add all that up, you get a really good fighter. I think this guy's going to make some noise at 160, based on what I saw. Yeah, I mean, he he never slowed down. Didn't look like you know uh, he was in. Uh, was even breathing heavy during that fight. He was accurate. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, great counters. You know, anything. Well, everything. What what if anything could. Uh, Gallimore have done differently? I don't think there was really anything he could have done. Uh, he couldn't box with Chair Cousin, you know, that was clear. And he couldn't bang with him either, you know, which you would you would have thought that that would have been his best chance to win the fight. Chair was was the one who got the better of the inside exchanges. He's the one who landed the hard eye-catching shots, not Gallimore, who was a good puncher. Uh, I just thought Gallimore was was outclassed. If, they, if he could do anything different, maybe it would just be attack recklessly and hope for a knockout yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But he, he was just outclassed. Right. And, you know, I mean, that's what I was thinking. The only thing he could have done really, really was throw more, but he was getting countered yeah, uh, so I mean, much that yeah, there's just not much he could do. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I understand why he wasn't as active as he um, could have exactly. been. What exactly. uh, what should be or in your opinion should be next uh, for Zerkazin? So that's a good question. I, I like Brian Mendoza 
you know, although I think that's a bad matchup for Mendoza, um, Cherkozin's combination of ability and his size, I think, would be too much for him. Uh, maybe Sergei Derevinchenko, who now seems to be like a stepping stone opponent for, for guys on the rise. Um, you know, Yoelvis Gomez was supposed to fight Rosario, but he had to pull out with a wrist injury. Maybe he's an option. Uh, he sort of, you know, earned the right to fight uh, uh, Rosario and, and then had to pull out. So maybe he's a possibility. But I think he fights a fringe contender, a contender. I think yeah. he's ready for that. And then who knows after that? I think, yeah, you got to take your time with him, you know, and, and you, you got something here to work with and, and no need to uh, to rush it. Now, the action kicked off on Showtime's YouTube page, former longtime Super Middleweight contender Andre Durrell, who's now campaigning at 175, took on the dangerous uh, Uneski Gonzalez. And Durrell is 39 years old, but he looked 10 years younger to me. Um, you know, the speed, the quickness, everything stopped Gonzalez and 10 rounds. How did Darrell look to you? I'll echo what Bob Santos said and say he looked pretty damn good, particularly yeah. for a guy his age. Uh, you know, I thought he was the next great thing back in the Super 6 World Boxing Classic days, which is like 12, 13 years ago. Uh, he was he was a terrific, unusually athletic boxer back then. I just loved the way he could move. Uh, really fast feet. Uh, which is how he was able to push Carl Froch to his limits and beat yeah. Arthur Abraham. Now, I thought he was never the same after Abraham was DQ'd after punching him when he was down. Uh, and he hasn't been particularly active the past several years, but I really liked what I saw on Saturday. You know, he's not, he's, I don't think he's as, quite as quick as he was, but he can still no. box. And he seemed to fight with a purpose I haven't seen for a while. Yeah. yeah it, it might not be too late for him to get some things done. He looked good. Yeah, and it was a lot more aggressive than I, you yeah, know, we're, we're accustomed to seeing from him. Who would you like to see him face next? Well, in his case, I thought of Marcus Brown. Um, I don't know whether Durrell could hang with Brown, who I respect. Uh, if he can, I think it would be it would demonstrate that he's a legitimate opponent for pretty much anyone. Uh, I also thought of John Pascal, you know, another older guy who I think I assume wants to make one more run. Um, some guy, somebody at that level to sort of demonstrate where he's at. Yeah, that's a, 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 I like those options, particularly the Marcus Brown one. I think that's a really, really good fight, uh, one I could get b behind, and I hope that we see something like that uh, in 2023, uh, 2023. Also on the Showtime uh, YouTube streaming, we also saw former unified 154-pound champion Julian Williams win an eight-round unanimous decision over the game. Uh, Rolando Mancia, I was in middleweight action. Mike, what were your thoughts on Williams' performance? Well, first, I want to say that this was the perfect matchup for him, an eight rounder against a solid but, you know, limited opponent. You know, he hadn't fought for 13 months. He was fighting at 160 for the first time. He was coming off back to back losses to Rosario and Vladimir Hernandez. He needed to just sort of ease into the division and get a win under his belt. And that's what he did. And I thought he looked I thought he looked like Julian looked like Julian Williams. He boxed really well to win a wide decision. That's what he does when he's at his best. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I did think there was some ring rust there um that he sort of shook off but it was it was the smart fight you know getting in there with someone who was rugged who was gonna uh push the pace and, and throw a lot of punches yeah you know really helped him shake off the rest who'd you like to see him face next again i think a fight with brian mendoza would be a good matchup for both guys uh i really like that fight um he could fight chair cousin if he dares uh, you know, that'd be a tough fight for him, but he certainly has the uh, ability to give Chirkaz and all kinds of trouble. Anyway, I see Williams fighting a fringe contender in his next fight. Yeah, I think he should just work his way back up, you know, go up the rankings, get yourself into the rankings at 160 and, and see what you can do and, um, you know, what's in front of you. Earlier on Saturday, undefeated light heavyweight champ Dimitri Bivol, fresh off his big win over Canelo Alvarez look dominant once again uh handed former 168 pound champion gilberto ramirez his first loss via 12 round unanimous decision what makes bivol so good i think it's a rare combination of natural physical gifts and a really really high ring iq you know in other sports when someone is really hot sometimes they say the action is moving in slow motion uh, for that person because they could just see everything so clearly. I think that's the case with Bivol. I think everything's just sort of moving at yeah. slow motion for him. Uh, he's just really quick and really, really skillful. I marvel at his defensive ability in particular. As I've said before on the podcast, uh, Ramirez 
is a good fighter. I really have a lot of respect for Ramirez. And he landed only 12.2% of his punches, according to CompuBox. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I think Bivol might be the best defensive boxer in the world. He might be the best boxer in the world, period. Yeah, yeah, he's just really, really hard to beat. And there's not, nothing extravagant about his game. You know, someone pointed out that he's kind of like uh, Errol Spence in that regard, where it's just he's he's masked like the, fun, the, yeah. the fundamentals. Just throws the one-two. If he needs to throw a hook or something, he will. But he can just beat you with his footwork, time. And 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 just the you know the the, the basics of boxing, uh, and and not to mention I mean I, sometimes I feel like he has a really left first gear, that there's just a lot more depth to his game than than even we we realize at this point. That's scary. But yeah, it is. <laughs> and and uh, you know if you're Canelo Alvarez and and you watch that, I don't know whether or not you want to fight Bivol again. W- what do you think happens if they were uh, if there is a rematch? I think Bivol wins again. Uh, I thought he dominated the first fight. I scored it nine rounds to three. I'll never understand the scoring. All three judges, I think all three judges had it 15-13, which is seven rounds to five. Um, I don't see what Alvarez could do differently. He's just not as good as Bivol, uh, in my opinion. And he's smaller to boot. And that's a bad combination. Uh, I'll say this for Alvarez, though. He claims uh, that he's been bothered by a wrist injury, and he did have surgery to repair it. Maybe that was an issue during the first fight. Honestly, though, I just don't think that would make any difference. If I were Alvarez, I'd fight David Benavides instead. Yeah, I don't even know if, <laughs> man, those kind of options. Um, but yeah, fights. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you know, it is what yeah. it is, and this is this yeah. is where he's at. But no, I, 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 I think that Bivol could beat him even worse in the rematch now that he's seen him. Uh, before and and uh, look, you know, Alvarez was sort of competitive early in that first fight, and then uh, Biz, Bivol uh, dominated, sort of walked away with it. I think he picks up right where he left off uh, in a rematch. And if I'm Carlo Alvarez, I'm in no rush to fight this guy again. The fight that Bivol said he wants is the undisputed bout versus Arthur uh, Better Bev. What do you make of that matchup? So that's a much harder fight for Bivol. Uh, better be of, in my opinion, is a better boxer than he's given credit for, or some people give him credit for, and he's got heavy, heavy hands, you know, which is how he's been able to stop every one of the, his, his professional opponents. Uh, and obviously, you know, Bivol wouldn't have a size advantage over better be of like he did against Canelo natural size advantage. You know, all that said, I think Bivol is too skillful for better be of, uh, if Bivol doesn't get hurt and that's a significant if, uh, I think yeah. he wins, I think he wins a clear decision in that fight. You know, I'm with you. I mean, you're right. Bivol was uh, was bigger than Canelo, but Ramirez was significantly bigger than than Bivol. Obviously, yeah, I'm not comparing. Gigantic, didn't yeah, he? I mean, he looked like it, like a heavyweight. I'm not comparing uh, Ramirez to Better BF. That's not what I'm saying. But look, I just think that uh, Bivol's footwork. He's shown uh, a great engine. Can do this for 12 rounds, and and I'm sure the Better BF will have his moments. But I like Bivol in that fight as well. If One I'm note. Right. Oh, what were you gonna say? It would be a fun fight. Oh, yeah, definitely. One of the best fights in boxing, no question. Um, uh, one note in Prediction League, uh, I'm 49-9-1, Mike 47-11-1. Time is running out on, on yeah. Mike this season. Uh, championship of, rounds coming up. Yeah, championship rounds coming up. You know, and I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm feeling like uh, Bernard Hopkins versus Felix Trinidad heading into the 10th round. It takes um, some risks, like like a fighter that's behind in the, on the cards. You're going to have to. Yeah. You're going to have to. And I got my counter shots ready. It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> so time to bring in our next guest. He is the undefeated 140-pound contender, one of the rising stars in the sport, uh, hailing from, from boxing royalty, Gary Antoine Russell. Gary, first things first, how are you and, and your entire family doing? Uh, you know, we're just taking day by day, um, trying to just stay highly favored and uplifted with our energy because we was always the family that maneuver as a unit and try to pull energy from one another. So if somebody was down, we knew that we can stay around family and one of us to kind of like energize or rejuvenate one another. Mm-hmm. And lately we've been taking blow after blow, my brother, my father, Gary Antonio, he just had an um, a upset moment, you know. Yeah. Uh, his last competition, but back to the drawing board, you know, it's things that we have to do to keep us obedient and in line. You know, we, we've done these things that show us that we can perfect our craft to the best of our ability. Um, we've been up against contestants and opponents that's been on a high caliber, and we arrived to the occasion, 
So it's not a thing of um, us being able to do it all again. It's a thing of we just need to recenter ourselves so we can keep it continuing. Mm. Um, so as of now, we're just trying to, like I said, get our burns right. Life outside the box and we're doing things that's, um, I'll say, adultish and it must get done type stuff. Gotcha. Well, you know, even in boxing, it's like it seems like if we see one Russell, we, we you know, we see all of them right behind each other. We last saw you in the ring. Uh, back in July, you stopped Francis Bartholomew in what was a really um, exciting fight. What would you say you learned from that? I, honestly, um, it was a lot to process that night. Before I came out, they had showed them a clip that they had put together. I believe it was PBC from PBC. Right. Um, but it clipped together on my dad. You know, mm-hmm. kind of touched while did the ring walkout. And the whole entire time, I'm thinking, well, this is what we do. Dad, I miss you. This is first, my first of many. You know, um, I've had fights when I had to listen to my father or an upset moment, but I knew I was getting back in line because my father was there. But this was the first time that I had no father in my corner. There would be no more dad in my corner. There would be no more coach in my corner. You know, at least the original. And throughout of our experience and existence, um, being a family, not just a, a coach and son type of bond, but um, throughout our entire existence, he's always been preparing us for the unexpected and things to that nature. Me going out here and competing, that's a second nature thing. Me going out to the gym and training and staying in shape, that's a second nature thing. You know, going and following instructions when your corner is seeing it and you not and you gotta fully submerge yourself into accepting those instructions and doing it that's something that was second nature it was taught but it was second nature due to my dad and our our whole little nucleus you know in the gym i been put myself in a perspective or the position to say okay this is what i do this is my sport This is my profession, and this is what comes with it. This is everything that comes with it. I have to be fully submerged, you know. So when I went out there and fought Francis Bartholomew, it wasn't an extravagant fighter or um, he got more goods than me. You know, the instructors in the corner, if you were to listen, you know how everything played out in video, instructions was given. I was trying my best, and I did my best to execute the um, press conference. I was getting recorded by the um, the, uh, the cameraman, and I was telling them word for mouth. If I was to follow script with the instructions that's given me, I would become victorious. I would come out victorious. It's not because it's my ability. It's just the IQ that we have the ability that I have on top of a lot of other things that categorize itself as a second nature due to us doing it for so long. Now, my worry was not a thing of the uh, the opponent in front of me. It was still me grieving. And even Uh after the I give myself a C, a C plus if y'all want to give that because of I can't take away the credentials of the opponent that I just faced. You know, he's not no he's this type of opponent. But based off of my performance, I would give myself a C. Okay, C plus based off of my performance against the caliber opponent that I had in front of me. You know, and all of that all of this wordplay that's coming out of my mouth, my perspective, is all rolls back to a second nature thing because we've always stayed together, doing things together and if you do stuff constant enough, it just have kind of like um, nothing new to it. It give you that vibe of it's nothing new. It's just something we wake up and do every day. This is a repetition thing. You know, as far as what I've learned, I have faced a lot of opponents that brings a lot of different attributes and styles. That's what the Olympics is for. But, of course, I mean, people can grow overnight from the Olympics to professional. I've dealt with professionals, many different calibers, many different fighting styles. You know, um, 
and I've went up against them and I've and not just held my own. I done ran through them or even just made them look like fools based off of me executing with my father, with Gary Jr., with Gary Allen, Gary Antonio was all voicing at the same time in the gym because we did things as a unit. So when I've learned, I'm pretty sure Gary Jr. learned, Mr. Gary Russell learned, Gary Allen Russell learned, Gary Antonio Russell learned because they was there to see it with their own two eyes and absorb it. All of the lessons and the messages and the wordplay that my father was giving me instructions, you know. So when I went up against Francis, it wasn't even a thing that I would be learning something because I've always told my, I would already tell myself, it's nothing that he can bring to the table that I'm not aware of as far as a skill set. Gary Jr. stepped in uh, as your trainer. So is he is he now your lead trainer, uh, you know, full time going forward? Yes, um, we're still operating as a unit. Gary, Mr. Gary Russell, is the head coach, head trainer. And we have Alan Russell, who's a second coach, mid man, second coach, et cetera. And as far as cut men, we have people who's been following our career for so long, like extended family members that's just into this profession as well, that's been in our corner, Mr. Gary Russell corner, you know, and it's nothing to give a reach a hand out and say, hey, would you mind come work in this corner this day? You know, we don't have a cut, but. What's what's it like working with, with your brother as your trainer? Uh, it's the same. It's the same. Mostly, I try to fuel him because I let him know what he don't know. Whenever you go to a doctor, they ask you what the problem is. I tell him, bro, the connection me and dad had is a different connection than me and you, bro. I understand you trying to take this position. I, I got to be all open to let you feel that position. And I got to be willing to take them instructions just as thoroughly as I was willing to take it from Pops. You know, and he understood it. But I was telling him, like, you got to... Um, Feel that position that my dad had. He can't. He can't have that. He can't be one foot in, one foot out. You got to be fully submerged, because I, I told him word from mouth. I said that was the only way Pops was able to perfect your craft. You're kind of like our blueprint. Wow. It wasn't like you was all about these other opponents. You didn't care about your other opponents. The only thing you cared about is if you had to go up against them because you was going to whoop them. That's it. You know what I mean? But Pops, he was the one that was saying, okay, Gary, you're not doing this. Gary, you're not doing that. Okay, your opponent, he's going to feel a little big-headed. He don't really got nothing for you. You know, stuff that you ain't seen, he don't got that. You just seen a lot already. You just got to stay prepared and be on point. Mm-hmm. Outside of the ring, Gary, you're doing this. You shouldn't be eating that. I don't think he's fully submerging himself to take that that leap, not just with himself, but with all of us, you know, with me and Gary Antonio, his other brothers, the other brothers that compete in this profession. If you're going to be full-fledged head coach, you got to do the things that a full-fledged head coach does. And I was explaining that to him. It ain't just giving instructions in the corner. It ain't just being there in the gym. It's on how serious you taking that time. How in-depth are you really getting into when you're taking this position you know it's interesting because you know he's more gary jr is more known for like you know defense and slick boxing skills you appear to be a bit more explosive and offensive minded has he so when you guys train together is he like working with you to on on his sort of style like get you to be a little more defensive minded or what's it been like no i mean uh, we all got our own type of style although it's similar you know and we always tell each other if it ain't broke don't fix it it was never a style thing. It was an obedient thing. It was a uh, a maturity thing. Because at the end of the day, that's what it all comes out to. That's what it all breaks down to in any match, any contestant, any opponent. Oh, by the way, speaking of which, do we know when Gary Jr. Uh, might return? Aha. Uh-huh. We're going to lead it in it. Okay. It's like okay. the rest of our moves. I'm only trying to give you what you need. Okay. Respectfully. <laughs> so Gary, this, this has been this has been a big year for you, obviously, facing back to back champions. What did you learn about yourself in those bouts? What I've learned, I've learned like I like I said, I'm prepared. 
I've been preparing myself for battles in the future and everything rolled back down to how much belief you have within yourself. How much belief do you have in your skills? Uh, and then sometimes it just go beyond belief. It goes into a category of you being obedient. Everything you do, you have to be obedient about it. Take it seriously. You know, anybody hurt in that ring. But I, I honestly feel like it's not a, I'm not stagnant as far as a learning process. It's the fact that I feel like I am a phenom. I am that, that great talent already. It's just the fact that I got to keep, keep producing um, situations for myself. Like a lot of people, they underestimate the fact that this is show business. It's a show side. It's a business side, mm. you know, but doing that, whole process when we was in the gym and my father was explaining this show side and the business side who was already fully submerged into our profession our skills the art of it so when i say a lot of these athletes they don't bring nothing new to the table i literally mean it. it's nothing new that i haven't seen but at the end of the day is your craft going to work or is his going to be yours that goes back to the belief thing. Mm. Mono y mono, right? right, right. You mentioned you, you made reference to the future. Is there any uh, indication when you might be back in the ring? Definitely. We're looking forward to January. Um, a tune up. Um, after the tune up, hopefully I can shoot for one of these titles like a WBC, Josh Taylor, IBF. You got British Pro Grade, I think, going for the IBF. But uh, I'm actually just looking forward to wiping out the division. Once I get the WBC and the IBF, whoever comes behind that Johnny come lately, they can, <laughs> they can get, a, get a spunk of it, you know? They can get a stench of me. We had the uh, the WBA champ, Alberto Pueyo, on here a week ago, and he, he said he, he was interested in fighting you. He said no man in the division is unbeatable. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, and, and, and is that a fight you would like? In the future, I would say he got to show himself to me. Um, he got an interim, then he worked his way up. I seen him uh, perform against a Southpaw fighter. Akhmadov, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His last one, he got yeah. the WBA belt. That's right, right. And he really didn't impress me. He did the things that was responsible with the caliber opponent that was in front of him. I don't think you have to be a, 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 a boxer to see that uh, that person should have got hit right there at that moment. Mm. Oh, that person should have weaved that shot. These are the responsible things. So when you break it down into a simplistic form, it's like, like I said, they're not bringing nothing new to the table as far as an art. I done been to the Olympics in 2016. I've seen many different styles from all over. And I had to deal with I had to adapt spontaneously, mm. you know, and I had to believe in myself and what my coach was telling me and in my craft. Believe that it works. If I do this and I hit them right, I know I'm going to get an effect. That's belief. But it also goes back to your training and your, 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 you being mature, you being obedient. All that is all wrapped up in one. So now that I'm a professional, I'm seeing it's kind of like the same thing. Okay, you just got some professionals that's just athletically still amateur. Right. You know, they just still look like a, a, a big amateur. It's not no Sugar Ray Leonard in his prime. He's doing all this phenomenal stuff, sh- sh- shuffling with his feet, trying to do the stuff Muhammad Ali do. It's not that panaz anymore, you know. that that's what she, That's the difference. In the caliber, that's the difference in the art. That's what I pay attention. That's what we've been taught in our in home. Me, Mr. Gary, Gary Allen Russell, for my dad, because he came up in the era when it was really some talented people out here. I'm not taking away the talent that's out there now, but it's a different level. It's levels to it. It's right. definitely levels to it. And okay. right now, what I see in this year of age, it's not really a lot of people. You got Danny Garcia. He's still there. 
He's going to be on his way out. Everybody in the world that deals with this profession know what Danny Garcia is going to produce. You got Terrence Crawford. He's been around. Everybody in this boxing world know what Terrence Crawford is going to produce. You got Earl Spence. He's been around. You got people now knowing what Earl Spence is going to produce. And it's not too far of a difference based off of the caliber of a fighter. Y'all are all great fighters, but Y'all still kind of like bringing um, something that's not far fetched to the table. Okay, Earl, you're a pressure fighter, a pressure boxer. Terrence Crawford, you're a boxer. Um, ooh, Keith Thurman, oh, you was a boxer. You expect a boxer to be a boxer and do boxing things, things that boxers do. Stay on their toes, stick and move, a little head weaving, you know what I mean? Punch your boxers, they're going to brawl, apply pressure, try to be calculated. You know what I mean? That's the that's the surface level stuff. And that's the IQ difference. But at the end of the day, who is really bringing that panache? Like, I don't know what he's going to bring, but he's, he's phenomenal. He's nice. You got the people that set up shots, one punch. Ah, that's a different level of IQ. Like, okay, that shows the professionalism in what you did. It shows. Uh, versus you just getting into a brawl and both men are throwing punches. And one man came out clean because he just landed a punch first. That don't show professionalism. Professionalism shows a high level of IQ, a high level of skill set, and a high level of intensity. All out of wisdom, though. I, that's what we've been trained to understand and to merge ourselves in. So when you see a lot of these fighters... Deontay Wilder, okay, he's nice, man. He got a lot of heart. You got to have heart to deal with this profession. It's a it's a, a contact sport. But all he right. got is that left hand work on some stuff. Whoever he touched with it, he going to put him out. That's all he got, though. Right, right. He got to broaden his horizon to his, to his skill set. So back to my question, what have I learned? It's not really much as what I'm learning. I'm fully coming into myself more. You know, I'm fully submerging myself with what I'm dealing with more. Mm. It's not new no more. When it stops, when it stops becoming uh, unfamiliar territory, that's when you can claim it to be your territory. They say a good dog, a good god dog, will be territory anywhere they go. Right. You shouldn't get the jitters based off of who's in front of you. You shouldn't get the jitters based off of where you go. All this goes back and, and, and ties itself to the person, the athlete. How good of an athlete are you? Are you fully full of yourself? Because you got to be fully intact when things are getting shaky and there's a lot of turbulence in that square. The corner can be yelling out instructions. God can be yelling out instructions, but you got to get yourself on that on that cruise control mode again. My father, we we didn't have talks, we didn't have sessions. My father dealt with every last one of his sons and made sure that we fully understood this and and retained this because the profession that we're in is not a game. He's telling this story. You can play, you can play basketball, you can play golf, you can play soccer, but you can't play boxing. <laughs> He's the same right. saying that exactly. But it's true. But it's true. My favorite fighter, McCullough. Look at him now. Right. Gerald McCullough, hit man. He was that oh, guy. Yeah. Body yeah, yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Now look at him because this profession is not a game. Yeah. It's not a game. You know, so right. a lot of times people, people get old overnight. I know you, you got, heard you the got term it. before. You got a lot more to go, though. You got a lot more to go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's why I say it's not really a learning thing. I'm just submerging myself more. As long as I can do that, if I if I find the, the time and be obedient enough to submerge myself more into my profession, I know I'll be the top gunner, hands down. Gary, you, you've weighed you've weighed around one thirty seven for most of your fights. Is there a chance we could see you at one thirty five, or are you committed to being uh, a champion at one forty? Uh, no, it's a chance. I'm committed to our plan. To be honest, um, I, we try our best not to deviate. All those things, all, all those things, just somewhat just get you shook up. You try your best not to deviate, and that's what we're doing as a unit. 
I mean, is there a fight at 135 that might be big enough to entice you to move down there? Oh, yeah. There, there, so there is. Is, that, is that something you see happening in the future? Because, I, I mean, you guys are both from the DMV, and the idea of Javante Tech Davis, Gary Antoine, that just seems like a huge, huge fight to me. Of course. Of course, don't you? Yeah. Look at my look at my style and look at Tank's style. That says pay per view right there all day in the front. Yeah. That's fight of the that's fight of the decade. So what? I said that's fight of the decade. I mean you talk about two guys with the amateur background, speed, explosiveness, power, boxing skill, ring IQ. it's a fight fan's dream. Exactly. And we got longevity history. I just seen him grow up. He just seen me grow up. We just came up in the same fight field, same time frame, vice versa. Right. Tournament, right. we was there when he was there. He just seen me cook boots and, and, and et cetera. Wow. Wow. I, I hope it happens, man, at some point in the future. I think that's a I super mean, fight. The business got to be right. Not only that, I think a lot of people just get caught up on their sales and the business being about themselves when the business is really bigger than them. Right. You know, we, we are like public servants, like public servants, basically. Mm-hmm. What we do, our art that we show and tell is kind of like public service. So as long as the public service network is going good, everybody is good. You can't make it fully about yourself because it's not just people saying, ooh and ah, we're touching lives. But inspiring people to be great, to push their vessel to the ability that they didn't think it can go. The future is what comes behind us. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Gary, yeah, behind us, watching what we're doing. So that's that's where people get lost at. Right, right. Gary, in closing, is is there anything that uh, that you'd like to say to your fans in closing? Keep following me. Keep promoting me to do great. Everybody do their sales as queens and kings if y'all around me. I don't want to hear no nigga. I don't want to hear no son with some cuz. If it is, keep it genuine. Yeah. Keep it genuine. Don't overdo it because you'll kind of like be burning the candle from both ends with me. I'm trying to promote greatness and royalty, but you want me to carry myself kind of like like a pest. I can't do it. I understand people's lifestyle ain't all cut out the same as others, but if y'all support me and behind me, understand how I conduct my life and how I live my life. And I'm trying to live it royally, you know? So peace and blessings to all my fans, all my followers. And stay tuned. Amen. Hey, Gary, thank you so much. I mean, we really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us. You said January. We'll hold you to that. We'll hope it because we can't wait to see you back in the ring and we expect big things from you uh, in 2023. Definitely. I appreciate you guys. It's time for Mike and I to go toe-to-toe, and this week we're going to unveil our list of the five greatest fighters of the 21st century. This includes the year 2000. We'll go in ascending order, so Mike, take it away. Okay, I just want to preface this by saying, uh, number one, we did not talk at all about this. I have no idea who Ken has chosen for these uh, picks, and he has no idea who I've chosen. Second, um, I originally had Roy Jones on the list, but I decided I couldn't justify it after doing just a little bit of research. Uh, He did some good things in the 2000s, but he started a steep decline in 2004. That's when he was stopped by Antonio Tarver. I wanted to add this. I want to say this. If we were talking about the best fighters over the past 30 years, he would probably be number one on my list. So number number five uh, on my actual list is Juan mm. Manuel Marquez. Mm. Uh, I went back and forth between Marquez and Chocolate Tito Gonzalez, uh, but I decided on Marquez because of his level of competition, particularly his four fight series with Manny Pacquiao. Uh, Pacquiao is higher. I'll just have to reveal now that Pacquiao is higher on my list, and I'm sure he's on yours, uh, which obviously is something that that he earned. I think he's one of the greatest fighters of all time. Yeah. Uh, and almost everybody agrees that Marquez fought him at least on even terms, even though he went one, two, and one in those fights. And he stopped Pacquiao in the la- in the last fight. Uh, Marquez was a master boxer and just tough as hell. You know, he's never stopped in his career, uh, which you can't say about Pacquiao, by the way. Uh, it was just an absolute joy watching Marquez fight. He was so special. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I will touch on Juan Manuel Marquez in a bit. Okay. Um, my number five is Andre Ward. 
uh, you know, we could list all the accolades. This guy retired as the undefeated, undisputed light heavyweight champion, who's also the unified super middleweight champion, who's a brilliant boxer fighting on the outside or on the inside. One of the best ring generals I ever watched. It's interesting. This guy was a 2004 Olympic gold medalist, and I remember he was on HBO very early in his career. And I watched like his first fight, and he got like hurt or dropped as a prospect. And I was like, mm, I don't know about this guy. Then they bring him back, and he got hurt or dropped in, in that second fight. I don't remember which fight it was that he got hurt and which fight it was he got dropped. I remember one of them was against Donald Boone, but it was another fight where he was badly hurt. And I was like, I don't. I think this guy was one of those, you know, really great amateurs, not so good professionals. And he went off TV for a while. We didn't hear from him. And next time I saw him, or I didn't hear from him, next time I saw him was against Mikael Kessler in the Super Six. And I was like, well, clearly he's going to lose this fight. <laughs> I remember Andre Ward. He was the guy that was getting dropped by, you know, guys I'd never heard of. And he put on a master class. You look at his overall resume Kessler, obviously, Carl Frotch, Sergey Kovalev, Chad Dawson, Arthur Abraham, a Hall of Fame inductee who. Probably didn't get his just due when he was an active fighter, but, you know, as is often the case, is far more revered looking back at uh, what he accomplished, Mike. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Ward in a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll just throw in right now. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the Super 6 World Boxing Classic. I remember he came in as the young guy, the underdog. I think I think Abraham was favored to win that, believe yeah. it or not. And, uh, and th this is what I love about these tournaments. It gives guys like Ward, super talented young guys or, you know, fighters on the rise, a chance to really demonstrate what they can do. Because you have to fight a top guy, you know, you know one after the other, which is, just doesn't have, usually happen in boxing. And he was just freaking brilliant. And I just fell in love with him during that tournament. And, yeah. you know, and the rest is history. Yep. What a joy to watch. I'll, uh, I was up into my number four since you kind of touched on him. Juan Manuel Marquez, uh, you know, four division world champion, won titles from 126 to 47. Uh, names like Marco Antonio Barrera, Juan Diaz, Joel Casmayor, Michael Katsidis, Derek Gaynor. Um, but as you as you noted, probably best remembered for his four fight rivalry with uh, Manny Pacquiao, uh, the one that he finished with that brilliant that shocking uh, six-round TKO Pacquiao back in uh, 2012, uh, a one-punch knockout that established Marquez yeah, as, yeah. Uh, you know, an all-time great. I think that just, you know, put the uh, put a bow on his career. Uh, one of the best combination punchers that I ever saw. Just a gem, a style that was, you know, so similar to Ricardo uh, Lopez for obvious reasons. Both of them were, were right. trained by uh, Nacho Berestein. Uh, but both those guys were just beautiful uh, boxer punchers. What a career Marquez had. Yeah, it's interesting. Once upon a time, uh, I, if somebody asked me the, of the the great Mexican trio of Marquez, Barrera, and Eric Morales, you know who was the who was the worst one of the three? I would have said Marquez, uh, right. because uh, Barrera and Morales gave us that incredible series. They were such incredible warriors, and Marquez was kind of known as like a technician. He wasn't like the action guy, right? So he was kind of kind of overlooked, but he just not only the outlast these guys, you know, he basically outfought these guys, you know, against, yeah. against the best, the best opposition. He said, you just kind of watched him just rise past, you know, past those two guys or above yeah. those two guys. And just now into the hall of fame, all three are hall of famers. It's a yeah. great trio. Actually, it was really a treat to be able to see all three, but I think he was the best. Yeah. 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 I, I, t I agree with you. Who do you got for uh, number three? Number four. Oh, was, is it number four? Oh, yeah, you, that's right. You just gave your, your number. number four. That's right. That's my right. No, my number four is getting ahead uh, of myself here is Bernard Hopkins. Hmm. Uh, you now, the guy's just an absolute legend. You know, it, it wasn't just that he was good, but that he was good for so long. Uh, Biop had a title reign that lasted a record of more than 10 years, which included 20 successful title defenses, uh, most of which took place in the 21st century, by the way. Uh, and he could still compete on an elite level in his late 40s. You know, he became the oldest to win a major belt when he defeated John Pascal at 46, which is just nuts if you stop and think about it. You know, I have a theory as to why he was still competitive as he approached 50. He always relied uh, on his brilliance, on his ring acumen, a lot more than he relied on his physical capabilities. So even if his physical capabilities started to slip a little bit, he still had his mind, and that just never left him. So he was yeah. just good. He was good almost to the very end. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why uh, he's my number three. Um, there you go. And I, I'm not talking about the alien. I'm talking about the executioner. I never liked that alien nickname, by the way. Um, but, you know, you, look, the 
the middleweight title defenses record, former light heavyweight champion, the oldest fighter ever to win a world title, uh, the Trinidad win, Tarver, Glenn Johnson, Kelly Pavlik, Winky yeah. Wright, uh, Keith yeah. Holmes. He had just about every skill in the book. I mean, he could box, he could brawl, inside, outside, movement, uh, precision shots, iron chin. He could swarm you. He could pick you apart at a distance. And, I mean, the Trinidad performance is probably the finest I've w- ever witnessed from anybody in a boxing ring. And, and that's, I mean, from then on, I just knew, like, I was looking at an all-time great, and here we are. Yeah, yeah, I really feel fortunate that my my era coincided with Hopkins' era, uh, and I got to know him a little bit too, and I and I really like the guy and respect the guy too. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I uh, I'm grateful for yeah. Bernard Bernard Hopkins. Who's your number three? So my number three is the aforementioned Andre Ward. You pretty much covered it. Um, I, I think he might be more still a little bit underappreciated. Uh, but you know, I think people, he's in the Hall of Fame, so obviously people know what he could do. Uh, yeah. you, know, you mentioned that he, he remains the last American to win an Olympic gold medal. Uh, he, unbeaten two-division title holder as a pro. Uh, he was like Hopkins in the sense that he was yeah. he was neither the quickest nor the most athletic fighter. And he certainly wasn't a knockout artist, but he was just a brilliant boxer. Uh, yeah. I, liken, I always likened him to an like, anaconda. You know, he wrapped himself around his prey and sucked the life out of him, mm. just fight, fight after fight after fight. He just diffused, whatever the guy had, he just diffused it. I was always so impressed by that. Uh, and you mentioned the names, Kessler, Abraham, Frock, Dawson, Kovalev twice. Uh, you know, those were just the best of the bunch. Uh, the guy retired undefeated and he didn't fight a bunch of stiffs. He was an incredible fighter. Yeah, he certainly was. And um, yeah, good, good, uh, good analogy there with the... Uh, I mean, just the way that he disarmed his his opponents. I mean, one of the things I enjoyed about him was watching how he would dismantle his opponents. So we are where are we at now? Number two. I assume that from here on out, it's uh. Yeah, we're gonna be the same. Pretty straightforward. Ninety nine percent sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, you want to sh- begin with yours and uh, okay, I'll sure. follow suit. Sure. So my number two is uh, Manny Pacquiao. So Pacquiao had his coming out in two thousand one when he stopped Leila Ledwaba. Um, in Las Vegas. So th- that makes this timing perfect for, perfect for what we're doing here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So after that, he, you know, he only won titles in a record eight divisions, if you count ring <laughs> magazine titles. Uh, and he captured the imagination of even ca- casual fans in the process, you know, but, you know, appearing multiple times on the Jimmy Kimmel show. He was just a true superstar. Uh, he, he had an unbelievable stretch between 2006 and 2011. Most people talk about the, I think, the 08, 09 stretch, but you can make it a little bit bigger. In 2006 yeah. to 11, he beat Eric Morales twice, Marco Antonio Brera, Marquez twice, Oscar De La Hoya, Ricky Hatton, Miguel Cotto, Antonio Margarita, and Shane Mosley. Uh, that's just nuts, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, at his peak, uh, people compared him to Henry Armstrong, and I always kind of thought that that was a little bit of a stretch, but I think he deserved the adulation. Oh, yeah. Uh, inc- incredible fighter. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, and aside from all those names, the fact that at 40 years old, comes back, beats Keith Thurman in 2019, that was oh, just yeah. insane to me yeah. Yeah. Um, that he could beat a prime fighter. as a true all-time great, one of the most beloved uh, figures in the sport ever. Sure. My number two is... Uh, as well so you you pretty much covered it i'm going to go to number one and this goes without saying obviously i could list who floyd mayweather beat but you know the bottom line is half of his opponents were world champions half of his 50 fights forget the fact that he never lost he this guy barely lost rounds period i mean he's on the short list for any legendary title that can be bestowed upon a fighter in boxing um, you know, revolutionized the sport on the business side for the fighters. And, I mean, his fighting skill, his talent, his dedication, his will, uh, you know, the combination just just unmatched. Uh, you know, I honestly don't know if we're ever going to see another fighter like Mr. Floyd Mayweather. Yeah, that's actually, that was the term I was going to use. Definitely one of a kind. And, and, and he's my number one, too, obviously, by the way. Uh, I think obviously one of the best whoever was ever done it. Um, you know, it's interesting. It just crossed my mind is the one thing he didn't have, maybe like Ali, is that he didn't have a, a lot of power and he still went 50, you know, and he still beat, right. he still beat all these uh, champions. So it's just, the guys, it was just incredible. Really, what more can you say about him? Nobody could touch him literally and figuratively. Yeah. Uh, the things I said about Bivol earlier apply to Mayweather, but times 10. 
uh, he was just so dominating, dominating every fight that I found it kind of monotonous to watch him after a few rounds because the, the fights just they weren't competitive and there was very little drama. It was just like, here we go again. That's how much better he was than everybody else, including the best fighters in the world you know, that he faced. Uh, I still would have liked to see him fight a younger version of Pacquiao, but he would have won anyway. Uh, honestly, the only fighters who could have competed with Mayweather fought in previous eras. Uh, yeah. one, once again, he, he was just one of a kind. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, I don't know if we'll we'll see somebody like in him and or anytime soon. Maybe not in my lifetime. I don't know, but interesting. So we had the same five names, just not necessarily in the. Uh, that's in the kinda, same you know, order. there are other guys that I thought of too. That's me too. A little bit surprised that we had all five of the same guys. Yeah, me too. I really wrestled with Chocolate Tito. Chocolate Tito could have been on there and um, Canelo and. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, I wouldn't uh, have put I wouldn't have put Canelo. And no, I by the way, I didn't put it, I didn't even consider any active guy because um normally I would on a list like this, but I just I just listen, they could lose their next five fights and then they wouldn't be on the list. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So I just, yeah, yeah, so I just didn't I just who didn't knows? I don't think Canelo would be on the list. Honestly. Well who That's, knows? Yeah. Canelo he maybe he has an incredible twenty twenty three and, we and he comes to... back and beats Bivol. Yeah, right. beats exactly. They yeah. close out you know, Bene- Benavidez, who knows? Hey, great fighter. Uh, you know what? Great fighter. He's a great fighter. Great fight. Like I've said many times, great fighters sometimes find a way to surprise you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what surprises are in store for us, too, and in, uh, uh, in 2023. And that's going to do it for this week's show. We want to thank Gary Antoine Russell and Bob Santos for joining us. And we want to thank you guys, as always, for listening. Be sure to check us out next week for more interviews, more boxing talk right here on the PBC Podcast.